Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore skepticism about remote viewing. With me is Dr. Paul Smith, a philosopher. He is the founder and director of Remote Viewing Instructional Services. He is also the author of Reading the Enemy's Mind and the Essential Guide to Remote Viewing. In addition, he has been past president uh, and also a co-founder of the International Remote Viewing Association. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. It's Pleasure. always exciting. It is. Yeah. It's always exciting. And, and remote viewing is so exciting. It's so oh, dramatic course. for people when they get one of these really striking hits. Yeah. And uh, you've seen it many times yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In spite of that, what would seem to be incontestable, uh, not only uh, experimental demonstrations of remote viewing, but practical applications in military intelligence, archaeology, and other fields, skepticism persists. Mm -hmm. Some of the skepticism, I think, is uh, interesting and valid, and, and some of it is just, I, and this is understandable to me as well, some people simply refuse to accept that this could be possible. Mm -hmm. and Russell Tark used to say, describe remote viewing as miracles. Yeah. In fact, uh, one early uh, peer reviewer of a remote viewing paper, uh, his only response to the paper was, uh, this is the kind of thing that I wouldn't believe even if it were true. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, skepticism has always been with the ESP field. Um, and sometimes it just serves as an anchor to it, to the research. Other times it's actually been beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the early remote viewing experimental protocols were enhanced by skeptical input. Mm -hmm. Not all skeptical input, because some of it was just really kind of useless, but, but some of it was actually beneficial in improving the research that they were doing. Well, I think one needs to distinguish between constructive criticism, mm -hmm. which is aimed at improving mm -hmm. the research, and hostile, destructive mm -hmm. Attacks where really the aim is to stop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, skeptics, uh, certain skeptics, right? They're just like uh, researchers and and practitioners of of remote viewing and other extra extra sensory perception modalities. They're not all created equal. There are lots of different skeptics, and they're motivated by different things, and and their uh, knowledge base, their understanding, and even their rational thinking is varies from skeptic to skeptic. And so, some of the criticism you get makes sense. Um, some of it doesn't make sense, but they think it does, mm -hmm. right? And um, some of the even some of the hostile skepticism is actually proven to be helpful yeah. in you know, correcting and improving the, the you know, research. The, the one criticism of remote viewing that I find the hardest to overcome kind of goes like this. If remote viewing works so well, how come the government ended their remote viewing program? Yes. And the answer to that is for the same reason that we have criticism today. There are people who accept the data, who have looked at it objectively. There are people who reject the data uh, and are skeptical of it. Uh, that was the case even back when it was in the military. The whole, all of the, the military apparatus, the intelligence community apparatus wasn't on board with remote viewing. There were people who constitutionally were opposed to it. There were people who were self-declared skeptics who, it wouldn't matter what you showed them, they wouldn't accept the data because they rejected the whole idea. There are other people who were skeptical, not so much of, of the reality of it, but, uh, there are stories about, uh, congressional staffers and some congress persons who uh, had religious qualms about it. They were concerned that you know, it might be demonology at work here or something like yeah. that. Um, th some of those stories are kind of overblown, but there is at least a hint of a little bit of that going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are lots of different reasons. And um, those guys were in the decision, oftentimes in the decision-making position. In fact, the reason the remote viewing program was terminated, one of the contributing factors, was that the 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 man who was running the CIA at the time, the, the director of the CIA, was um, 
I always get his name wrong, but I think it was John Deutsch. Okay. Right? I, his last name I remember very well. So Deutsch, but I think it was John Deutsch, who was actually um, a, a credentialed sci- uh, scientist. Right? Uh, I think, in fact, uh, maybe the nuclear physics field, something like that. And uh, he was famous for tossing people out of his office if they even brought up the term remote viewing. He said, uh, essentially, that he didn't believe in it and he had no time or use for it. And so he was the one that was actually handed that program in 1995. So it's no wonder that it got terminated. Mm. But he was just the last in a whole series of, of decision makers who actually were opposed to this, were skeptical themselves. It kept going as long as it did because there was another set of people who knew that it was it worked and they were supporting it along the way. And if, if I recall the story correctly, because yeah, the funding had come from many different agencies, uh-huh. at that point, a decision had been made that the CIA should take over the program uh-huh. and he didn't want to. Well, I have not heard personally from him. But there's some indication that was what happened. And, of course, those guys don't want to go on the blame line. Somebody that high up prefers to get some underling to be responsible for things like that, you know. But but he certainly I, – I think that he certainly played a major role in it mm-hmm. not being well, accepted. Well, the major document uh, criticizing remote viewing came out right before the program was killed, as I recall. It actually came out after the program was killed. Uh-huh. And it was used as justification for ending the program. But there's the timeline. The program was terminated on June 30th of 1995. The study that was used to justify terminating the program wasn't even started until the following month. And then, of course, it found out the remote viewing was no use and, and recommended terminating it. But it had already been terminated. <laughs> okay. So so the decision had been made in uh-huh. advance of, of and, the study. And the and, study itself um, had, uh, if I recall correctly, Ray Hyman drew one conclusion uh-huh. from it. Jessica Utz, who was a past president of the American Statistical Association, mm-hmm. drew the opposite conclusion. Yes. And in both cases, they weren't given access to all of the data, That's none of correct. the operational uh, findings, but strictly a, a, a series of recent uh, experimental reports. In fact, in that in that case, of course, uh, Ray Hyman was the skeptic. Jessica Utz is a, a proponent. She's she's been involved in in a, a lot of extrasensory perception, paranormal, so called uh, kind of research in a very responsible way. Yeah. Um, so, what happened was uh, the people who are doing it. So there there were probably a uh, hundred or more research projects done involving thousands of remote viewing sessions over the history of the program from 73 up until uh, 94, 95 frame. Uh, the decision was made that they'd only look at the most recent 10 experiments. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was all they gave Jessica access to, Jessica that's access to. And she said, this is ridiculous. I'm going to go out and I'm going to pull in data from from other similar research paradigms. Otherwise, we can't really make a, a, a decent assessment. Ray Hyman himself, in the body of the report, says, you know, is, it, is the end of the body of the report something wrote uh, in relation to it, that uh, they only had 10, 10 uh projects to look at, but unfortunately, 10 projects aren't enough to really make an evaluation of the overall efficacy of the research part yeah. of it, right? Well, he was one of the ones who decided to only look at 10 of them. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so, so you know, that, that, that part of his question, well, the operational part, and you have me on a soapbox, I apologize, but the uh, operational part of it, they only looked at 40 of the last sessions that, that they themselves commissioned, the evaluation team. So they actually did look at some of the operational. Not, not Hyman and Nuts. They didn't oh, see those. Okay. This was the, uh, the, the, the American Institutes of Research were the ones that conducted this mm-hmm. assessment. And people working with them and they, and they themselves were the ones that evaluated 40 operational remote viewing sessions commissioned um, in 1994. And that was what they based their success, their estimate of success of the program on. But that 40 represented less than 2% mm-hmm. of all of the operational work done in the program. So they essentially didn't, didn't evaluate 
the vast majority of the work that was done there, and yet they drew a conclusion based on that small sample. And the conclusion that they drew is that it, it was of no value. That's that's right. And would you uh, do you have knowledge of those forty oh. instances? And yes, and in fact, uh, of some of them, I mean, some of them, the, the, some of the details are published actually in the uh, report itself as an appendix, as mm-hmm. I recall. And uh, I also have knowledge from talking to, to some of the former viewers okay. who actually worked on these things, yes. right? And, because by uh, that time, you were, had long left the program. Left the program. Still had clearances, but I'd left the program. Mm-hmm. And um, what was interesting is, at least, is that at least one of the agencies that they requested, you know, taskings to do these sessions from actually evaluated the results fairly highly. Mm-hmm. So when they said, even based on that small, tiny sample, that it was of no use, one of those agencies actually would have disagreed with them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you form your own conclusion about this, but but that report is one of the most poorly done evaluations of an intelligence discipline that I that I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, as I recall uh, from my conversation with Ed May, over the life of the program, there were 19 different agencies that submitted tasks mm-hmm. for the remote viewers, and 17 of the 19 came back for more. There were actually at least 38 who tasked the unit. Oh. Yeah. At least well, I'm going from from memory of my uh, uh-huh. of my accounting, right? Okay, and I'm pretty sure it was thirty. I know it was over thirty. Okay, uh, so all I right. think thirty is the right well, number. Well, thirty-eight is nineteen yeah. times two. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Okay, <laughs> maybe that was the half that the contract well, that contacted well, there may, SRI. For all I know, there may be you know divisions within one organization. Well, no, these were something. distinct entities. Really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it involved the Intelligence Threat Analysis Center, it involved the CIA, it involved the NSA, it involved uh, the, UF- UF- the Air Force Intelligence Command, it involved Secret Service. Um, I-, I can't name them all off. Mm-hmm. You know, there are just a whole bunch of them. And a few of them were onesies and twosies, but most of them had at least two or three or more taskings. The CIA actually had the most taskings of anybody, even after they had bailed out of the program. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, now, if I'm a skeptic, I would say, hey, if you and Ed May can't even agree on the number of uh-huh. agencies that submitted tasks for the program, why should we accept anything? Well, uh, First of all, um, that's a that's a fallacious argument anyway, right? <laughs> Just because you have two sources that don't agree doesn't necessarily mean there isn't a real truth, yeah. right? But uh, but the other thing to say is that Ed and I were in different places at different times, mm-hmm. and we had a- have access to different information, yeah. and uh, and so you would expect the answers to be somewhat different mm-hmm. based on what we know. Yeah. Uh, my response is based from the actual tasking documents out of the remote viewing program, mm-hmm. the, the, the military starting in 1979. Mm-hmm. Okay. And those are the ones that tasked the Army and then the DIA. At, at Fort Meade. At Fort Meade, starting yeah. in 1979. There were okay. roughly 38 of those, whatever mm-hmm. the exact number is. I don't know. Uh, I don't know which 19 Ed has in mind. They maybe have been ones who also tasked SRI because SRI did do some operational yeah. work, right? Mm-hmm. And so no, I'm, I don't know for sure, but I was yeah. under the impression because he told me this in the context of a uh, video, in fact, uh, released today. Oh, good. <laughs> I think I saw that actually. I yeah. think I saw the um, announcement. A video released today mm-hmm. about the Stargate archives that Ed yeah. has arranged to publish, as, as you probably know, for. Four volumes yes. of material. This, I think, is number two, is it not? The number two has yeah. been released. Three and four are already with the publisher. Hmm. So I, th- I thought that that's where he got that number from. If you have half thousand dollars, you can pick them all up, right? <laughs> they, yeah, they cost uh, $95 yeah, pretty each. Much each. So I think they'll be mostly in libraries, but it'll be a, yeah. a valuable resource for people who really want to dig into the weeds. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I've already bought the first volume. I'm definitely buying every volume that comes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, they're very, they're going to be very useful and yeah. very valuable. Um, and, uh, you know, other people figure out how to get them themselves. Sure. You know, but look at your local you know. library, if, yeah. if nothing else. But let's come back now mm-hmm. to the skeptical criticisms. Let me ask you this. What criticism do you think has been the most valuable? Huh. Well, that's a tough one. Um, let me see if you think back of the ones that have been lodged. Okay, so for one thing, and uh, 
I don't. I can't tell you the most valuable one. I'll give you some examples, right? Okay. Um, and uh, these will be fairly non-specific because specific, right. I haven't researched that part of it uh, recently. I haven't looked reviewed it. So um, at SRI, they had a number of exper- experiments that were successful, mm-hmm. but their statistical analysis had some problems, and um, and skeptics weighed in and said, "You got these problems," mm-hmm. and then. The Hal and Russell and the people involved there were very conscientious about looking into it, evaluating if it really was a problem, and then if it was a problem, uh, fixing it so it wasn't a problem next time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you see this actually throughout the history of parapsychology, that yeah. as new research protocols uh, are brought out and they work them, and then, of course, the critics jump in on them, probably yeah. more more viciously than most other disciplines, but still, they jump in on them, and they start saying, well, you got this wrong, you got this wrong, got this wrong. Then they uh, the researchers go back and look at that and mm-hmm. determine, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, well, how can we fix that? And then they fix it. Mm-hmm. Uh, good example is the Gonsfeld, where uh, uh, there was some uh, discussion between Ray Hyman and um, – you know his name. Charles Honerton. Yeah, yeah, Honerton. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Hyman critiqued the way they set up some of their targeting and some of their processing. Mm-hmm. And Honerton um, and others working with him corrected that. Mm-hmm. And Hyman was sure that uh, that when they corrected those errors that they wouldn't get a result. Yeah. And lo and behold, they got um, at least about as good a result as they got before they corrected And Hyman them. and Honerton co-jointly published yep. Uh, about that, where they had agreed in advance that mm-hmm. about the protocol that was required. That's right. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of examples of that, um, mm-hmm. probably even many I don't even know about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah, many people have a myth. I've read it in, in books written by skeptics. They will say, as soon as they start to tighten up the controls, the phenomena disappears. And then it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, one of the interesting things about these uh, accusations of, of flaws in the experiment mm-hmm. is that uh, there's a couple of things you have to keep in mind. First of all, a skeptics will say, well, this experiment is flawed because X could have happened and that could have led to this good result. But if you didn't do X, then, okay, well, that might be true. But the second requirement there of the person making the accusation has to show that it actually was present. If that flaw isn't present in the experiment, then it's not a criticism of that experiment. Yeah. It doesn't undermine the experiment at all. If the, if the flaw is there, then it counts. But just alleging that there's a flaw without demonstrating where it is um, doesn't count. And yet there are a lot of experiments that have been criticized and somewhat tarnished by skeptics making claims about flaws that just aren't demonstrably responsible for the results. Mm-hmm. That's one That's one of the big issues about this. Uh, and, you know, there's a good example involving Dean Radin, who's the, the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Dean uh, published this big meta-analysis of, sci- of uh, ESP-related kinds of uh, experiments and produced this massive, massively significant uh, statistical result and uh, got published in Nature magazine. And no, I'm sorry. A review of his book in which that was listed was published in Nature yes, magazine. That's right. And then a, a skeptic who fancied himself a statistician wrote a letter to the editor, which claimed that that uh, Raiden was totally wrong and that the statistics didn't work out the way he said, and there wasn't any real. And and there was a huge flap over that. And Raiden was able to demonstrate that the skeptic was totally wrong. In fact, an independent judge was able to evaluate that the, that the that the correspondent was totally wrong. Raiden actually was completely right. Mm-hmm. And then Nature refused to print a retraction until Nick Herbert and uh, um, British Nobel Science Brian Joseph Brian yeah. Joseph Brian yeah. Josephson and uh, Nick Herbert, a physicist here mm-hmm. in the U.S., who were both very influential. Put the thumb screws to him, and Nature finally published a, a very subtle retraction, yeah. saying that okay, Dean Radin was right because they, of course, don't want him to be right. You know, uh, they're they're hardcore physicists. Well, I think they also, kind of, if to their defense, okay, uh, have a policy about if you publish an article and somebody publishes a criticism, you don't mm-hmm. keep publishing oh. criticisms of the criticism of the criticism yeah. of the criticism. They they draw a line usually after one response. Yeah, that seems a little 
short side. And a lot of opinion. journals do that. Yeah. You know. Well, I understand having the limit, but you'd yeah. think at least you, someone was entitled to a rebuttal mm -hmm. well, for criticism. Uh, you know, I know this. As yeah. a parapsychologist, I feel it personally. I think that a lot of skeptics are motivated by uh, factors that are subconscious yes. and that are unrelated to their criticism altogether. And their criticisms mm -hmm. uh, don't deserve to be taken seriously because mm -hmm. those skeptics haven't even studied That's right. the, the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's put those aside mm -hmm. right now because otherwise it seems as if parapsychologists are always grumbling about the skeptics. And yes, yeah. they are and they are for good reason. But yeah. I'd like to be able to uh, say, let's give the skeptics credit. Okay. And uh, for example, I, um, in the interview that just is released today, and of course this mm -hmm. interview won't be out for a couple weeks. So, sure. uh, it, for, if you're viewing this interview after its first release, you can look and find the previous one, Stargate Revisited with Ed May. Here's mm -hmm. what he said. He said they put together a scientific review board. Yes. And SRI and SAIC, which later was responsible. And in order to be on that review board, you had to be a skeptic, mm -hmm. but an open-minded skeptic. Mm -hmm. He said that, uh, and they had a dozen such people, famous people, mm -hmm. on the review board looking right over his shoulder at all of the mm -hmm. research. And he said they would get into big arguments. They'd meet like once a month, as I recall. Mm -hmm. and, and many of these skeptics never came to accept the... Um, findings or the conclusion that Ed mm -hmm. May drew that this is a legitimate phenomena, mm -hmm. but they would have it out. And Ed said, we would win 95% of the arguments because we did our job well. Mm -hmm. However, he said, the 5% where we lost, those were the real valuable ones. Mm -hmm. That's where they really learn something. Yeah. Well, as we often say in remote viewing, failure is a better teacher than success is. Yeah. And I'm sure that's probably a common saying in lots of wisdom disciplines around the world. So um, I know, uh, I hear from people who are skeptical all the time and they have umpteen complaints mm -hmm. about uh, parapsychology. And I think most of them are uh, based on ignorance. But for skeptics who really want to dig in, who who want to be constructive uh, in their criticism, not just keep complaining or, uh, you know, acting like an armchair quarterback, mm -hmm. you should have done this, you should have done that. Uh, if they're really interested in improving the research, mm -hmm. my feeling is that they would be welcome. Yeah, well, they well, ought of course, to be. Well, you know, the late Marcello Truzzi was, yes. I consider, an open-minded skeptic. Indeed. Uh, and he actually, I, uh, I, was instrumental in getting him invited on board to be one of the founding uh, directors of the International Remote Viewing Association. Yes. And he was on there till he died, unfortunately, of colon cancer mm -hmm. in 2005, and, and I think. Nobody could question his credentials as a skeptic. That's right. He was one of the founders of PSYCOP, too, mm -hmm. the, the original uh, Society for the Investigative, well, whatever it is, you probably it's a know society, it. the Committee for the yeah, Scientific no. Investigation of the Claims of the Paranormal. Yeah. These are, I, I, for the most part, they're not philosophical skeptics at all. They're no. debunkers. Or, yeah. In fact, Stanley Krippner says they're not even debunkers because a debunker has to have bunk to yeah. debunk. <laughs> he said they're scoffers. <laughs> yeah, which was, of course, uh, Marcello's term. He, he called them scoffers. And uh, yeah. that's maybe where Stanley Krippner got it. But, I be but surprised. Mar Marcello felt that they, they were too zealots. Yes. Zealots. Well, and if you look at it... Um, I've used the comparison of religion before and mm -hmm. uh, uh, in talking to others. Um, in, a, in a way, it's kind of a religious conviction. You know, they're religiously convicted that there's a certain way of looking at the universe. And and this whole idea of ESP, parapsychology, undermines that belief. And so it's almost like they're uh, desperate in a way. Well, they're in the field of philosophy, and mm -hmm. that's where you earned your doctorate. There are people who follow the uh, writings of David Hume, one of the greatest mm -hmm. of all philosophers. In his article on, on, on miracles. On miracles. Yeah, he says, some, stage. So if some person comes to you claiming that they've uh, witnessed a miracle, you can be certain they're either a, a fraudster or uh, mm -hmm. a fool. And and now you also have a major school of philosophy today called naturalism, which mm -hmm. basically says if it's not a natural phenomena, it didn't occur. 
Yeah, and, and that, of course, uh, we've had a talk about physicalism in the past. Yes. And yes, physicalism, of course, is the heir apparent of that whole, the whole model. Yeah. Um, and essentially, it defines itself, it says, if uh, everything is physical and if it's not physical, then it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's a, a very rough and ready way of saying it, but yeah. that's kind of the premise. So, so, yeah. so, many of these people feel quite justified. This is what they were taught, how they were mm-hmm. trained, that uh, claims of the so-called paranormal uh, are bunk by definition. Yeah. So, and, and this is where it, it's like religion, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, um, and, and it actually goes back to uh, Thomas Kuhn, who, uh, who wrote the structure of scientific revolutions and, yeah. and really brought into use the word paradigm. Yes. Right? You get a paradigm, which is essentially a context of belief. Okay? You have a concept of belief. You have faith premise, principles that, are, that inform it, assumptions of things. And science has its own faith assumptions as well, right? So, um, we're in a religious setting. Uh, someone might come along and challenge your religious beliefs, the beliefs you're religious. You actually get emotionally involved and get upset and even may get aggressive. That happens throughout history where uh, you have a religious aggression. It's very often because underlying core beliefs are challenged by a competitor and, and you have to uh, – combat that in some way. And you, you see that kind of happening with the skeptics as well. Now, I'm not saying it's just them. I mean, you get true believers on the other side who kind of get impassioned as well. I got and, very aggressive once uh-huh. with a skeptic. I was on a panel with a very eminent skeptic, Ashley Montague, oh, a uh-huh. noted uh, writer. He'd written about 50 books. And mm-hmm. the subject of parapsychology came up on the panel. I think it was the Association for Humanistic Psychology. Oh, ah, well, you're already in enemy territory there. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was an officer, as a oh, matter okay. of fact. The, the American Humanist Association oh, is, the, is the one associated with PSYCOP. Uh-huh. The Association for Humanistic Psychology actually gave birth Earth to the Association for Transpersonal oh, Psychology, okay. which is very spiritually oriented. So, but but you get a mixture yeah. of people there. And Ashley Montague got up, and the subject of parapsychology came up, and he said, uh, he said, I believe in open mindedness, but not to the extent where you have holes in your head. Yeah, and I just launched into him <laughs> <laughs> because I was sitting next to Charlie Tart on the uh-huh. panel, who had been doing, you know, really good parapsychology research. I felt he was insulting my friend and mentor, Charlie Tart, uh-huh. and I, I, you know, became like a warrior. I was imbued with this thing, and I later on I was embarrassed because I had gotten angry at a very distinguished scholar and yeah. even though I think he his comment was out of line I uh, I'm sometimes susceptible to strong emotions I think we all are yeah uh, and I've had to learn over time with many conflicts on the internet mm-hmm. to what's that uh, is a passage in proverbs about uh, soft dancer turneth away wrath or something like oh, that you know uh-huh. uh, you can disagree without being disagreeable, in fact, it's to your advantage to do that because then you don't necessarily ramp up the conflict. No. And, uh, but sometimes you can't help yourself. You know, I, I know sometimes I just come unglued because something, uh, gets said or done that is just totally unconscionable and I haven't mm-hmm. got a hold of myself in that moment, you know. And, and the truth of the matter is that like every discipline of study, parapsychology is competing for scarce research funds Mm -hmm. and and gets, you know, we're we're at the very bottom of the pecking order when it comes to research If there's trickle-down economics, we're getting the pennies. Yeah. (laughs) And I I mean, we're very proud of the fact that uh, the remote viewing program was funded for 20 years mm-hmm. and some, I don't know, $20 million or, or so went, went into the program. But frankly, let's, let's face it. That's over 20 years, $20 million. That's such a pittance for any broad field of research. Let me give you a perspective point here. Yeah. If you tabulated all the money <clears throat> that had been spent in parapsychology research since the 1890s, it wouldn't be enough to buy one F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. <laughs> no. 
Okay. Can't even buy one airplane with that money. It's, it, it's that's trivial. apples and oranges, though. If we compare it to psychology or biology, right? But or, I'm trying yeah. to give a perspective on how much money we're talking yeah. about. Because yeah. oftentimes, another skeptical criticism is they wasted so much money on that program, right? They they, they wasted oh, twenty million dollars on money, taxpayer money. Yeah, yeah. But but I'm I'm telling you, that was that that twenty million dollars is probably ten percent of one airplane. And it's probably some of the best money the government has ever spent. Absolutely. It's one of the cheapest programs they, they got. And, and we did solve some, some very noticeable problems with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more problems than they, they throw money at lots of things that have no useful outcome, yeah. ultimately. So, uh, like the, the, the money argument missile is, system. Well, yeah, and remote viewing terminated that. <laughs> <laughs> at least the system is termination. Yes, but yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Well, the missile got fielded, but the basing plan didn't. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Well, the idea, if I recall from that system, was missiles would be moved around on sp a special railroad train so that the you know, Soviets would never know where our missiles were. Yeah. And they had shelters the missile could fire from. Mm -hmm. So they shuttled them around. It's like this big uh, shell game kind yeah. of thing, right? Uh, but, and, then, and then it came out that, it, that it, they looked at the remote viewing data and they said, you know, remote viewers uh, could be used against this system. Well, it was Charlie Tart, actually, that, that provided the data for that. Oh. He, uh, the SRI folks leveraged his information. Yeah. But he did an experiment with a bunch of um, undergrads where he wanted them to predict where, with a set of 12 circles, a particular oh, yeah. cursor would show up, right? Yeah, yeah. And they had one uh, young lady who was successful – a hundred percent of the time. Now, now, when I say a hundred percent of the time, she, she was right. I don't know. I don't want to say 40 to 50 percent of the time, but using statistical error correction mm -hmm. and enough runs, she was able to a hundred percent of the time predict where the missile would be. Mm -hmm. And that information actually got used. Ed May can tell you about this. That, uh, Hal put off, wrote up a, a paper for this and submitted it to his people, right? And that was influential in Carter canceling the MX basing plan program. Um, and there is now a letter from Senator Warner that certifies to that fact mm -hmm. that Ed May has in his possession. So uh, that was one case. Actually, uh, we have mentioned in another interview that uh, that Robert Gates said it, that in uh, that uh, remote viewing information had been, never been used to affect policy decision. I forgot about that because that's a policy decision, and mm -hmm. remote viewing information did affect that. And if I recall, the MX system had it been put into place would have cost hundreds of billions yes, of dollars. Yes, it was hugely expensive. Yeah. And just to get into strategic nuclear arms here for a minute, which is another one of my fields years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the to me, the biggest problem with the MX basing plan is uh, the goal in nuclear weapons has always been the more and more accurate. So you can take out the weapon systems without having to take out the enemy cities. Yeah. You don't want to blow up the cities. You want to blow up the weapon systems. The MX basing plan would have forced the Soviets to target our cities because they couldn't get our weapons. So it was essentially pushing us backwards in the arms race to where we were holding our own citizens hostage. Oh. So remote viewing's contribution to canceling that program was really a blessing. Mm -hmm. so. Well, back to the skeptics. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are some of the other skeptical... How many, how many hours do we have? <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I don't. I don't want to uh, belabor yeah. the this uh, the subject too much. But the, there, I know, been many other critiques of of remote viewing. Mm -hmm. What what stands out in your mind that we haven't yet discussed? Well, um, so uh, the critiques of remote criticisms of remote viewing actually have been fairly few in terms of formal. Research. Mm -hmm. There was one in 1988 that the uh, Army Institute of Research commissioned, uh, and Ray Hyman was involved in that one as well, in which they found that remote viewing is of no use. But then in that case, they had no access to any of the remote viewing data. They, they formed that conclusion based on access to the, looking at civilian research programs and stuff. And so they only got limited exposure to what was being done with remote viewing, and yet they formed that conclusion. That's strange because, I mean, the published data in, in the books by Targ and Putoff and, and others uh, at that time showed really striking hits. They did. Um, but that was a limited data set because mm -hmm. a lot of the research was still behind the green door, as yeah. we say. 
uh, in the classified world. Other of it hadn't been published at the time of that. Mm -hmm. Some of it had been published but was not actually accessed. Uh, One of the interesting things about that study was that – dang it, I wish I'd gone back and reviewed because I'm uh, forgetting names again. Uh, Shoot. Well, anyway, uh, they had a a noted uh, science evaluator Mm. evaluate the ESP-related research, and he certified that the research seemed to have been done in a very – Satisfi- satisfactory way. And it's a- and unfortunately for the evaluators who seemed to already have an a priori bias against it, it had not shown that it was bankrupt, right? It hadn't shown that it was, that it was bad. And so they actually wrote a letter to this guy asking him to, to withdraw his evaluation of that material. And uh, probably by the time we're done with this interview, I'll remember his name. Yes. <laughs> but uh, that was a quite a big, uh, a scandal because John Palmer and I think Jessica Guts was one of them and another author wrote an actual monograph, a short monograph, but one uh, criticizing the people doing the research for this for demanding that that, inform- that that review be withdrawn. And the guy who had, who had made the evaluation uh, wasn't even a parapsychologist. He, they had just asked him to evaluate the science, and he'd given them a straightforward – and I've talked to him since then, if mm-hmm. I could remember his name uh, – <clears throat> And his assistant, and both of them were really outraged by that. They thought that was totally uh, intellectually and scientifically dishonest to mm-hmm. make that kind of a request. Uh, but it shows you how desperate sometimes the skeptics are to try and and diminish uh, what's known about this field. Let me make sure I understand what you're saying. A reviewer mm-hmm. of remote viewing studies came up with a positive evaluation, uh-huh. and he was then asked to withdraw. Withdraw that evaluation, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Rosen, Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Oh, yeah. Uh, I believe Robert Rosenthal. Ra- at Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. A very prestigious, prominent, well-known, well-respected guy. Yes, one of the proponents of meta-analysis, yes. as I recall. Which is why he had this job. Yeah. You know, he had nothing to do with that research. Mm-hmm. His only job was to evaluate this, the, the, the statistics evaluation, do kind of a meta-analysis and that's, of the data. that's his specialty. <laughs> that's right. And they yeah. wanted to reject it because it didn't have the mm-hmm. findings that they wanted to have found. Well, I, I am very heartened by the fact that after 30 years of not discussing anything about about parapsychology, the mm-hmm. American Psychologist, mm-hmm. flagship publication of the American Psychological Association, just a couple of months ago published a study done by Etzel Cardenia, who uh-huh. is a parapsychologist working in Sweden, in which mm-hmm. he looked at all the meta-analyses that have now been done in different areas of parapsychology, remote viewing, Gansfeld, uh, card guessing, on and on. Uh, six or seven different ones that had each achieved a statistical uh, improbability of a chance result at greater than one in a billion, or mm-hmm. what they call Six Sigma. Yes. And and uh, so the meta-analyses have shown that even though the phenomenon is stochastic in mm-hmm. nature, meaning, you know, it's statistical, it doesn't ha- work every single mm-hmm. time, mm-hmm. it's sporadic, but over the long run, looking at, I think, um, something like the, these meta-analyses included w- over a thousand individual experiments, mm-hmm. the, the, the results are overwhelmingly positive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I haven't seen that study. Um, yeah, I'll send you a copy. Please do. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see and, it. And frankly, for our viewers, I can't distribute it broadly because it's pub- copyrighted. Sure. But I can distribute it to individuals. And if mm-hmm. somebody contacts me individually, I'll send them a copy of this study because mm-hmm. I think it is extremely important. Do you have 10,000 copies? <laughs> What's this? It's YouTube. It's a gonna... PDF. No yeah. problem. Yeah. I can make 10,000 <laughs> if I need to. And, and for those of uh, you who are viewing, who have access to uh, university libraries, you will find it in the American Psychologist, the very important publication. The last time that they published anything about parapsychology was over 30 years ago, and that was also a positive analysis. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so here's my question. The Government, as far as I know, and mm-hmm. as far as you know, I suppose, has not been in the remote viewing business now for over 20 years. Right. 
you uh, yourself are an example of a an entrepreneur who has established a remote viewing business, an educational business, mm -hmm. doing remote viewing. Would you say, in your experience, that the people currently doing remote viewing are achieving the same level of success that you were aware of uh, when you were in the military? Um, I think that a certain percentage of them are, mm -hmm. yes. I've had some students do some stuff that just is amazing, and it would have amazed me if we'd seen it at Fort Meade. Um, one of them, actually, I had Remote View NSA, and the kind of stuff she produced was the kind of stuff that get you thrown in jail 20 years ago. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she produced some actually real interesting factual stuff about NSA. Um, the National Security yes. Agency. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm exaggerating and thrown in jail, but it was stuff that, that was very telling about, mm -hmm. you know, what the agency did. Well, right. this was the concern that from the very beginning, according mm -hmm. to Russell Targ's documentary, why the CIA was interested and later frightened, it would seem, of, of Pat Price's ability to enter into uh, secure facilities. And Yeah, I, I don't think they were particularly frightened of it. I think they wanted to leverage it. They, I think they were excited about it. Mm -hmm. Um, now, they, they were a little concerned that the Russians might be doing it to us. Yeah. Uh, and that, that cropped up a number of times during the course of the program's mm -hmm. history where they have us try and, by using us as mm -hmm. kind of a reverse engineering to find out what the Russians might be able to get. Uh, one example is a stealth aircraft. You know, they yeah. couldn't ask the Russians, how good are your remote viewers and remote viewing our stealth aircraft? So they had us remote view our stealth aircraft to see what kind of results we produced. Yeah. So uh, the fact that we did produce really striking results um, was sufficient, I think, to get people worried about it. Well, and, what you've uh, just told me is incredibly significant. Mm -hmm. If if private entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. small business people such as yourself are able to task remote viewers to look inside of government agencies like mm -hmm. the NSA, yeah. Uh, if I were in that agency, I would be just as concerned about that as if it were the Russians. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> a little bit less concerned than the Russians, but still concerned. Because you don't have any control over who has what information. And, uh, and you know, the, the average person who's remote viewing NSA, as in our example, yeah. out of curiosity, is not going to do anything nefarious with it. But somebody who might be inclined to... That possibility exists that they might be, uh, I, might try I, it, right? You know, it just seems to me that, uh, based on what I know about remote viewing, mm -hmm. and I've, as, as any viewer of my program knows, I've had many conversations with mm -hmm. many people involved in, sure. in, in remote viewing. If, if you're running a large enterprise of any sort, whether it's private or in government or in the nonprofit sector, uh, this is a, a resource that could be of value to you. Yeah. And the interesting thing, there's a paradox here, right? A lot of remote viewers really wish remote viewing is widely accepted and that they could get jobs, you know, helping, you know, doing remote viewing for industry yeah. and stuff like that. But on the other hand, if it was widely accepted, there would be these kind of concerns. And who knows what kind of controls they try and impose on it. So at one time you want it to be widely accepted. In the other case, maybe it's not so, maybe it's good it's not so widely accepted. I don't think it's the sort of thing that can be controlled. If a private citizen yeah. wishes to get together with uh, Paul Smith and the uh, remote viewing instructional s services and, and see what's going on behind closed doors anywhere in the world, who's to stop them? Who's yeah. to even know about it? Well, that was one of the reasons why the security envelope was so so tight around yeah. the remote viewing program because really the only way to stop yeah. remote viewing is to take out the remote viewers. So they didn't want anybody to the, – the identity of the remote viewers was the most deeply held secret at mm -hmm. uh, in the Fort Meade program. Well, now yeah. it's pretty public. It is, but, you know, then, then in one way, in one respect, being in public is actually a protection as well, mm -hmm. you know, from a perspective. But frankly, the fact, the, the truth of the matter is nobody's being down our doors to, to spy on the, on the, either the Russians or the Americans, you know, so. Well, this is where the criticisms are important. Mm -hmm. uh, why aren't they beating down your doors? Uh, and I think one of the reasons is right now it's still not widely accepted as a, a real thing. Why not? Um, be, well, because of the inherent skepticism built into the society, right? Um, and, and in fact, the skeptics have an active program to try and maintain 
a kind of a skeptical No, I'm edge. aware. I'm aware of that. These yeah. organizations like PSYCOP are really primarily aimed at public relations, yeah. and or they, whatever PSYCOP is called now. I don't yeah, know. there may be a new name. Huh? Yeah, it has a new name. I can't think. In, what it in is, any yeah. case, there there are armies of people who who are like Boy Scouts, devoted to the cause of naturalism or yeah. s- what they call skepticism, yeah. which is they're far, missionaries. Uh, pardon? They're missionaries. Yeah. You could call them missionaries <laughs> or uh, rationalist revolutionaries. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, but I, I do know that they're very active. I, mm-hmm. I, I hear from them all the time, yeah. as a matter of fact. But it seems to me that what remote viewers are still struggling with uh, is the, que- the issue of consistency. Yes. And that's the other same thing is the fact that remote viewing isn't like a video camera on location. Yeah. You don't pick up. It, it, it's still a, 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 it's in the process of development. And, and it probably given the nature, since we're dealing with human psychology, human perception, which neither of those are 100% mm-hmm. systems. You know, if we, there are perceptual illusions. There's, there's cognitive confusions. There's yeah. all kinds of things. And, and that's the really the big part of the room of viewing process is that comes got to come through that. So it'll probably never be a, a hundred percent absolutely correct mm-hmm. literal kind of a depiction of whatever it is you're trying to discern. It's just that you increase the amount and and quality of the information. Isn't that, that true of uh, everything in dealing with the intelligence community? Uh, it is mostly yeah uh-huh. yeah or uh, maybe not everything. In aggregate, but, it is. Now yeah. I mean, for example, if you. If you do get a satellite photo of the late, latest Russian missile mm. system, that's pretty hundred percent thing. Although you still don't know anything but what it looks like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, you have to piece that together over time. So in one respect, that still uh, agrees with your your analogy there. Um, well, Paul, uh, we, we've covered a lot of ground yes. here. Uh, once again, it's been a pleasure, a delight. It's been very informative and insightful. And I'm hopeful that this conversation will uh, find eyes and ears for many, many years into the future. Uh, because I personally think that, uh, uh, like all emerging fields, remote viewing is is going to solve some of these problems that that are keeping it from I think if we give it a chance yeah given enough time remote Mm -hmm. viewing is going to become much more mainstream than it is today Mm -hmm. in in my belief and we're contributing to that by this very conversation so thank you so much oh you're welcome and thank you for being with us (laughs) 